today I'm going to talk about ancient aliens and Soviet science in the animated film Phaethon, the Son of the Sun. This film is an interesting example of how Greek myth is conceptualized within the discussion of technological and scientific progress. It was directed by Vasily Livanov and produced by Moscow Animation Studio Film in 1972. Python was the first and only part of the series Great Mysteries of the Universe and is entitled uh, Film Hypothesis. Centered around the narrative of the Greek myth about Python, son of Helios, who drove his father's chariot with disastrous consequences and was struck by Zeus's lightning bolt, the film presents a hypothesis about the planet Python existed between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, the destruction of which supposedly led to the formation of the asteroid belt. With my analysis, I demonstrate how this animation film addresses tendencies in contemporary Soviet science and relates to the development of the tradition of Soviet science fiction. In my paper, I hypothesize how ancient astronaut theories found a way into educational content. In conclusion, I argue this film reflects the geopolitical <clears throat> anxieties of the Soviet Union in 1970s. The narrative frame of the film reflects the complex relationships between the future and the distant past. It begins with the spectator who watches a broadcast of the lecture, probably in the planetarium. The lecturer briefly describes the structure of the solar system, discusses a problem of the origin of the asteroid belt and proposes a hypothesis about the missing planet. Then, the focus shifts to the parallel narrative about an expedition of the spaceship Python 1, with the mission to find the origins of the asteroids in the asteroid belt. The story about Python and his chariot ride is introduced as an explanation of the name of the spaceship as a myth known to ancient Greeks and Egyptians that perhaps originated from legendary Atlantis. This remark indicates that Phaethon's myth in this film is consciously considered in the context of Plato's Timaeus, in which Critias tells the story of Atlantis that was told by Egyptian priests to Solon during the his trip to Egypt as follows. There have been and there will be many and diverse destructions of mankind of which the greatest are by fire and water and lesser ones by countless other means. For in truth, the story that is told in your country as well as ours, how once upon a time Phaethon, son of Helios, yoked his father's chariot and because he was unable to drive it along the course taken by his father, burned up that was upon the earth and himself perished by a thunderbolt. That story, as, it's, as it is told, has the fashion of a legend. But the truth of, of it lies in the occurrence of a shifting of the bodies in the heavens which move around the earth and a destruction of the things on the earth by fierce fire which recurs at long intervals. Not only a combination of several narrative frames in the film could be influenced by Plato's dialogue, but also the principal idea that earth is strongly affected by events that happen in space. The reference to Atlantis and Timaeus in general implicitly introduced the theme of the most perfect race that were destroyed by some kind of a, of a catastrophe. The, this theme, theme will receive full development in the second part of the film. The second part of the film is focused on the space expedition interrupted by the lecture in the planetarium. The spectator is still uh, watching it on the screen. The lecturer interprets the myth of Phaeton as, quote, according to some scholars, ancient poetic evidence about real events, the destruction of the planet Phaeton in the space catastrophe. The hypothesis of the lecturer is proved by the space expedition that finally reaches the asteroid belt and comes to the conclusion that it is the remains of the destroyed planet. The idea of the destruction of Phaethon received particular interest in Soviet science beginning from the 1950s. Soviet academic Vasily Fasenkov in 1950 proposed that Phaethon fall into pieces because it came too close to Jupiter. 
Alexander Zavaritsky in 1955 studied meteorites as parts of hypothetical planet and suggested that it was destroyed not by an explosion, but by some other processes. Ivan Putilin in 1953 believed that the destruction of Python happened because of the fast rotation of the planet. And Konstantin Savchenko suggested that one of the Python's moons collapsed on its surface. The astronauts in the film propose two main versions of the destruction of the planet Python. The first version is that the planet was inhabited by an advanced civilization and was destroyed by the nuclear explosion. Second and most probable, according to astronauts, version is based on the scientific hypothesis that was suggested by Soviet astrophysicists in 1950s, that Phaidon collided with another celestial body, comet for example, or as Vasily Fesenkov proposed, it was destroyed because of the gravity of Jupiter. This, one of the astronauts remarks, is in, reflected in the ancient Greek myth of Phaethon, who was killed by Zeus's thunderbolt because, he concludes, Zeus and Jupiter are the same mythological character. The scientific explanation of the destruction of the planet as the most probable one seems logical, but the way how this choice is rationalized is quite, is quite unexpected. Phaethon wasn't destroyed by the nuclear war of advanced civilization, not because the existence of advanced civilization in the solar system is scientifically less probable, but because, I quote, on Earth, we had not reached this point. Humans managed to prevent the madness of destruction. High intelligence is not compatible with war. The epilogue of the film shows the landing of Phaetonians to prehistoric Earth and their meeting with early humans, suggesting that the development of civilization on Earth was impacted by the alien visit. This film combines the elements of educa educational animation, science fiction, and, and pseudo-documentaries featuring alternative archaeology and ancient astronaut theories. In 1960s and 1970s, the interrelation of science and science fiction was very prominent. Josef Shklovsky, a Soviet astronomer and astrophysicist, wrote a popular book, Universe, Life, Intelligent, in 1962, that offered the idea of paleocontact in a more scientific context. English translation of this work was supplemented by Carl Sagan and published with the title Intelligent Life in the Universe in 1966, that sparked the discussion of extraterrestrial life in the scientific community, philosophical debates, as well as in popular culture. For example, science fiction writer Stanislav Lem, in the introduction to his book Sum Summa Technologiae in 1964, the collection of philosophical essays on problems of the distant future and its, its technological development, notes that Shklovsky's universe life intelligence was, was a key source for this project. 
Stanley Kubrick, for his film 2001, A Space Odyssey of 1968, briefly consulted Carl Sagan, who suggested, as he himself wrote afterward, that, quote, any explicit representation of an advanced extraterrestrial being was bound to have at, at least an element of falseness. And the solution is to suggest rather explicitly to explicitly display. And as we know, the first scene of Kubrick's Odyssey features a suggestion of extraterrestrial visit. It doesn't show it. A good illustration of the relationships between science fiction and scientific research is an article uh, by the physicist Vadim Bronstein published in the scientific journal Zemlya Vselenne, Earth and Universe, with the title The Origins of Asteroids in 1971. In this article, Bronstein criticizes several hypotheses concerning the missing planet and the asteroid belt and supports the hypothesis of Soviet astronomer Otto Schmidt, who proposed that asteroids, Earth and Moon have the same origin and formed at the same time. At the beginning of the article, Bronstein writes that it is published as a response to several letters from the readers of the journal, asking about asteroid belt and particularly about the planet Phaeton. Bronstein quotes a question from one of the letters by Olga S., who asks, do our scientists know that Phaetonians were highly intelligent people? Uh, Bronstein replies, with all respect, no, scientists do not know whether Phaetonians were highly intelligent creatures. You say people, why so directly? They even don't know whether these imaginary Phaetonians existed at all. Science fiction writers, not scientists, can speculate about it. Scientists working with facts cannot say even whether there was a planet Phaeton. Facts are stubborn. These ideas were cultivated not only by, by so Soviet scientific discord, but also in popular culture and particularly in science fiction. The biggest contribution to the wide distribution of these ideas was made by a series of science fiction novels by, by Alexander Kazantsev with the title Faeti that was published in between 1968 and 1971. The first novel, The Destruction of Faena, narrates about the inhabitants of Phaeton, the race called Phaeti, who destroyed their planet with nuclear weapons. Several Phaeti, however, survived, and consequently, some of them inhabited Mars, some came to prehistoric Earth and meet uh, early humanoids. In the sequel of this novel, with the title Sons of the Sun, Phaeti from Mars visit ancient South America and India, where they, where they are seen as gods and um, that descend from the sky. The last book, The Tribe of the Sun, features Soviet archaeologists in the near future who discover traces of extraterrestrial being on Earth. Then, in Earth's orbit, they find the artificial body with the records that describe events that happen in the first and second book. An expedition is sent to Mars, and in the caves, they meet the dying civilization of the Phaeacians and help them make the planet more convenient for habitation. Besides obvious parallels between the animation film Fight on the Son of the Sun and uh, Kazantsev's novels, I found the link that suggests that the film is not referring, is, if not referring to Kazantsev's novel directly, but shares with it the same source of inspiration, at least. Um, one of the original illustrations for the third book of Fayette accompanies, um, it accompanies the first publication of the novel by Juri Makarov, depicts the protagonist, the archaeologist, who interprets the ancient artifacts as traces of e extraterrestrial visit. As we can see, there is an uh, unusual figure with a crown that looks like antenna on the top of its head. The very similar image we see in the last scene of the film Phaethon that depicts Phaeacians landing on Earth, meeting prehistoric humans in the cave, and then being commemorated in the wall painting. In fact, this is a real image um, that comes from Tassili, Najir, the plateau in the Zahara Desert with prehistoric cave art and some of the images also appear in the film earlier. French archeologist Henry Lote, who conducted an expedition to Tassili in 1950, 
657, 1959, 1962, and 1970 introduced the findings to the wider European public, but at the same time contributed to the spreading of ancient astronaut theories by emphasizing the extraterrestrial nature of, of the images. Some of which, as we learned afterwards, he falsified, but we don't know which ones. These images as evidence for an extraterrestrial visit, including the round-headed figurines with antennae, received big popularity after their screening became the culmination of the first West German documentary film by Harald Reynel with the title Chariots of Gods in 1970. It is based on the book Chariots of Gods, 1962, by Swiss amateur writer Erich von Däniken. The film was distributed in Soviet Union in 1970 with the title Memories of the Future and became extremely popular and people were waiting in long lines for hours to get to the movie theaters to see it. Writer Kazantsev even appeared in the beginning of the documentary as a proponent of ancient astronaut theories. This film and Daniken's book laid the foundation for the rich tradition of alternative science and archaeology in popular culture, such as the History Channel show Ancient Aliens, where Daniken himself appeared in the pilot episode and two biographical episodes the von Däniken legacy in season five and the alien phenomena in season 13. The film Phaeton, the son of the sun, employs some rhetorical strategies typical for alternative science books and TV shows, particularly what Kenneth Feder, the passionate critic of pseudoscience in his classification of rhetorical fallacies of pseudo-archeology pseudo defines as the inkblot hypothesis, the interpretation of ancient artifacts as a representation of extraterrestrial presence on Earth solely based on visual associations and without any consideration of historical or archaeological context. One of the supporters of alternative, as he defines it, archaeology, Cornelius Holtorf, in his article, Beyond Crusades, How Not to Engage with Alternative Archaeology, in 2005, who was strongly criticized by Kenneth Feder and his colleague Gareth Fagan, suggests that archaeology is not about the past, but it rather creates meaning significant to the contemporaries. Hotter claims that, quote, academic knowledge is constructed in the present and not directly re related to past realities and also that different visions and experiences of the present constitute a range of contexts in which the past and its remains are given meaning. Although I cannot agree with the legitimacy of pseudo-archaeology alongside actual archaeology, I believe that studying pseudo-archaeology as cultural phenomenon can tell us a lot about contemporary ideology and ideas rather than about the past. For example, behind pseudo-archaeology and particularly Daniken's book often exists racism and colonial attitudes that manifest in the ideas that deprive non-Western civilizations of their skill and agency and instead prescribe the cultural achievement and technological progress to aliens. The film Phaeton the Son of the Sun includes the elements of pseudo-archaeology as the reflection of the present. I argue that the apocalyptic elements that, that are so integral part of ancient alien narratives and alternative archaeology play an important role in the Phaeton, communicating the pacifist message that responds to the fears caused by Caribbean crisis and the Cold War addressing the anxieties about the future of the human race in a planet with the nuclear weapons. The key to the understanding of the film is the explanation of the impossibility of the nuclear war on the planet Phaeton. High intelligence is incompatible with war. Thus, Mythological Phaethon losing the reins of Helios horses becomes a metaphor for the uncontrollable use of nuclear power. 
Unlike Kazantsev novel, in which even the high level of civilization did not prevent inhabitants of Python to blow up their planet, the film promotes a more positive view on humankind as moving towards peaceful progress. Thank you for your attention and see you at the conference.